In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. It occurred to me I probably ought to explain to folks who may not have been here that long that when I preach and I'm taking something like the uh, parable of the sower, which we have today, I, I like to do the historical context before I get into application. Uh, I, I just can't help doing that. I'm a very linear guy, and I've got to do the, the background and what, what, it, what it meant in its original context before I try to get into how it might apply to us. So Matthew 25 uh, has three parables in it, and this is the very end of Jesus' teaching in Matthew's Gospel. Um, before in this, Jesus has come into Jerusalem for the last week of his life before he was crucified, and he has cleared out the temple. He has uh, denounced the, the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders. He has um, predicted and told his disciples what the last days were going to be like. And then finally, he tells a few parables that are very powerful. Uh, last week, uh, many of us were on the men's retreat, but Travis was here preaching on the parable of the ten bridesmaids. And then today is the parable of the uh, talents. And next week, I don't know, I think it's next week, uh, is the Feast of Christ the King. And it's the parable of the sheep and the goats. And then after that, it's just the Last Supper and death on the cross and resurrection. So this is the very end of, of Matthew's teaching or the teaching of Jesus in the book of Matthew. And so what is this parable about? If this is such an important parable, what is it about? Well, it, 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 we can read it in different ways and I'm gonna look at it a couple different ways today, but all of them involve the concept of stewardship. Um, Stewardship, what is that? It's being entrusted with property or money by the owner of the property or money uh, with the understanding that the steward will manage it. And there's the implication that there will be a profit. Uh, in the parable, a man goes on a journey and entrusts his property in the form of talents of, we assume, gold. I'm assuming gold. A talent was the weight of a person, maybe 100 pounds back then. It was a lot of money. And he entrusted each according to their ability to one five, to another two, to another one. And so how much money is that that was entrusted? If you take say, well, actually back then, it was equivalent to 16 years of a daily wage. 16 years of a daily wage was one talent. That's a lot of money in any time. If a person were paid $45,000 a year today, then that would be $738,000 for one talent. For two, it would be a, a million four seventy-six thousand, and for five talents, it would be three million six hundred ninety thousand. So this master entrusted a lot to these three servants, and the first two traded the money, and they made a hundred percent profit, and the master commended them. He said, "Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little." Well, wow, sound like a lot to me, but I will make you, I will make you, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And the last one was not faithful. Uh, according to the story, he went and buried his money. And when the master returned, he said, Master, I knew that you were a hard man. I knew that you reaped where you did not sow, you gathered where you did not scatter seed. And so, I was afraid, and I hid your talent in the field, and here, I'll give it back to you. Well, uh, we might pause here for a second and ask a few questions. Was the master really hard? 
Was he unfair? Didn't he have an agreement with his three servants that they would manage this money? Was he unfair to expect that they would make more with it? And didn't he reward those who actually did a good job? The master had reason to be displeased. He replied, and I paraphrase, if you really thought I was like that, then you wouldn't have been so lazy. Why didn't you just take the money down to the bank and invest it, and then when I came back, I'd have at least some interest on it. But he said, take the talent from him and give it to him who has more, who has, pardon me, who has 10 talents. For everyone who has will more be given, and he, who has an, and he will have an abundance but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast that worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, the first way that we can read this parable is as a description of how God was dealing with Israel's leaders. And going back a long way to Genesis 12, to the calling of Abraham, we read how he and his descendants were intended by God to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. In other words, to all the people in the whole world. But thousands of years later, when Jesus, the Messiah, you could say he'd been on a long journey, shows up, the leaders of Israel had become horribly corrupt. And they were, as the prophet Jeremiah described them, false shepherds of God's flock. And what did Jeremiah say? He says, God's going to remove them. God's going to put his shepherd in charge of them. He himself will be their shepherd. And so, when you think about it, God has entrusted to the leaders of Israel great wealth, great riches. And I'm not talking about money. The law of Moses, the covenant, the temple itself, all the promises in the Hebrew Bible were entrusted to them. And when the Messiah shows up to claim his own, they were asleep on the job. They'd buried their talent. In fact, they rejected the very one who'd given them everything they had. And so now they would be cast out. And the true shepherd, the good shepherd, would be in charge of God's flock. And who are the faithful ones? They would be Jesus' followers, his disciples, who would be faithful to share this message of good news to the ends of the earth, to all the families of the earth, to all the people of the earth. Now, this is one way to read this parable and it may well have been what Jesus intended when he said it. But that doesn't mean it doesn't apply to us. Um, actually, it has everything to do with us. We also are stewards. We're stewards of everything that God has given to us. Life, health, physical and mental abilities, artistic abilities, family, parents, husbands, wives, children, extended family, friends, jobs, education. I mean, it just goes on and on, every single thing. And this is Thanksgiving week. We like to think about all that God has done for us this week. So, these are... these. Are, we're stewards, but most importantly, God has given us this relationship with him through Jesus. That's the most precious gift of all, the fact that we can know God, that we can know his love, that we can know his forgiveness, that we can know what Jesus called being born anew, that we can have his resurrection life in us. The question is, what have we done with what God has given us? With everything that God has given us? What have we done with the love he's had for us? Have we passed that on to others? 
What have we done with his forgiveness? Have we forgiven others? What have we done with the gospel, that good news about Jesus? Have we shared it with anybody that they might also know the one who is so precious to us, who loves us so much? Even Abraham was not blessed so that he could just enjoy life. The original purpose that God called him and blessed him was that so he would be a blessing to all the families of the earth, to all the people of the earth. And that's what God, our Heavenly Father, wants for each and every one of us. You didn't know that God expected anything from you for all that he's done? Guess what? He does. If you didn't hear it ever before today, I'm telling you that this is what God says in his word. He does expect something from you. We were created to be stewards of all that he's given us. Yes, there are many in this world who live entirely selfishly and for themselves alone. We're not to judge them. That's, that's human nature. They're not necessarily bad people. They're just not faithful stewards. We're called to a different kind of life as followers of Jesus. We're called to this stewardship. And Scripture tells us there will be a day when we do give an account to the Lord for this life. Now, I want to make something very clear. This is not about salvation. It's not about are you going to go to heaven when you die. If you've trusted Jesus who died for you, for your forgiveness, so that you may have eternal life, then it's already begun in your life. He's not talking about that. If you've trusted Jesus, you already know the love that God has for you. You're already one of his children. <clears throat> but when this life ends, the Lord wants to say to you and to me, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little. Let me put you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. So, these are two ways of looking at the gospel. One is about the leaders of Israel, and the other is about us. Now, you may not know this, but this year we decided to do our stewardship in the first in, in December, the first Sunday in December, December 3rd, the first Sunday of Advent. And this is the last stewardship sermon you're going to hear from me. Because <laughs> I'm not going to preach on it that day. I may have some, a few testimonies. But um, every year we ask you, the congregation of the Church of St. Clement, uh, to make a financial commitment to God through this church. And I've talked generally about being a steward, but I want to talk more specifically about financial stewardship. What does the parable of the talents have to do with financial stewardship? Well, I will tell you. What is money? It represents our work. It represents our effort. Or it may be that you received everything you have as a gift. It doesn't matter. They're all, it's all from God. And as I said, this week is a week of thanksgiving. We like to reflect on all that God has done for us and give thanks for that. But is that all that God asks of us? And I'm going to tell you the answer is no. We should be grateful. But God tells us there's something we should do if we're truly grateful. And that is that he wants us to return a portion of that which he gives to us. This is all through the Old Testament. And it's all through the New Testament. In other words, we're to show our gratitude to God by offering a portion of that which he's given us back to him in worship. And so whether you're on an ACH or you give online or you write a check and you send it through the mail, when it comes that time in the service that we call the offertory and we pass the basket around, 
It doesn't matter if you put anything in that basket or not. There's a lot of different ways to give here. But that's the time when you're supposed to say to the Lord, Father, I'm giving back to you a portion of that which you've given to me. <clears throat> so we offer it in worship, and then we use it for things that God cares about, not things we care about. There are a million great causes out there. Uh, some of them I think are hilarious, but anyway, I won't say that. Uh, anyway, no jokes. Um, very serious matter. What does God care about? Well, first of all, he cares that people hear the good news. And so we invest in missionaries and ministries that preach the gospel and tell people who don't know about Jesus, about him. And God cares about the poor, the widow, the orphan, the last, the least, along with the lost. And so we give to ministries that, that do that. But there's a third thing that he cares about, and that is his church, his body. And yes, there are ministries, there are people that do ministry of evangelism and mission work, and people that do ministry among the poor, they're part of the church. But then he cares about the church itself. Um, what is the church? Why, why should we give to the church? And I'm going to answer the question, why should you specifically give to this church? Um, first of all, I think Jesus used a parable. He said the kingdom of God is like a seed that's it's the smallest of seeds, and it grows up, and it becomes one of the biggest plants. And even the birds of the air flock into this tree. He said, well, I, I would suggest that it may be another analogy would be like coral reefs in the ocean. And we read that coral reefs are under attack by a lot of pollution and such. And I would say that the church in America, and particularly in the West, is under attack. And like a coral reef, it's, it's shrinking. We see this statistically. Less and less people in America identify as believers in Jesus. But these reefs are very important because they provide an environment, a community, through which all kinds of life thrives and reproduces and generates all kinds of nutrients for the oceans. And that's what the church does. The church provides this environment where all kinds of ministry and all kinds of mission takes place. I don't think she has a coral reef up there. Um, so what does the church do? What does it actually do? Well, first of all, we preach and teach the Word of God. At least, hopefully, we do. That is our goal at St. Clement's. Our goal at St. Clement's is that if you bring someone who doesn't know Jesus, or if you're a visitor who comes here who doesn't know Jesus, then you're going to hear about Jesus. And we want you to fall in love with Jesus. We want you to decide to become a follower of His. And we want you to experience Him personally encounter him on Sunday mornings and throughout all the activities that we do. Our men's retreat last week was incredibly powerful. Incredibly powerful for a number of you. Um, secondly, the church provides corporate worship. Yes, I suppose you can worship God out fly fishing, but when I fly fish, I'm only praying, Lord, would you please give me a fish? And then, thank you, Lord. This is when the people of God come together and the, the, the scripture says, the Psalms say, God is enthroned upon the praises of his people. There's something special that happens when we come together. And here, we're blessed. We have clergy to lead worship. We have ushers and prayers and all kinds of people, musicians that make this worship Truly glorious. Thirdly, the church provides pastoral care. And I don't mean by that pastors caring. Pastoral care is the work of the whole body. We reach out to people that are hurting, 
that are going through a hard time, that are sick, that are lonely, and you don't even know about it. The clergy all go out and make home visitations, take communion out to people. I had a a phone call this last week from Nancy Loisel. Nancy hasn't been able to be back to, to El Paso for six months because her health has been so tenuous. She couldn't come back. She was able to come back for a few days. She met with a few people. She called me up and she said, I have to go back to Houston because I can't get the medical care that I need in El Paso. I have to get it in Houston. She said, but I want you to know, I feel so connected to St. Clement's I feel so, I'm so grateful for all the people that pray for me, all the people that support and reach out to me. She said, she just went on and on and on, and she wanted you to know that she feels very much a part of this body, and that's the way this body is. You would never know how much we care for people that are going through difficult times until you're one of them. And I see some of you nodding your heads out there. That's if you tell us that you need it. <laughs> That's if you even tell us. Third, uh, fourth, we, we provide discipleship. There are people that are being raised up in our, in our congregation right now as leaders who didn't even know Jesus a few years ago. And they're moving into leadership and they're capable because they've been walking with Jesus every day and they've been discipled by you. And... Fifth, we reach out beyond ourselves. Unlike a lot of churches, we actually give away a minimum of 15% of every penny that comes into this church. 10% goes to missions and ministries that, help, that not only preach the gospel and, and, and take care of those who, who are in poverty, but we give another 5% to our diocese for its ministry. And we do things like Operation Christmas Child. You guys did, I think, 120 shoe boxes with clothing and tracks in them for children around the world who wouldn't get a Christmas present either, any other way. We, we're trying to reach out to our neighborhood, and we're beginning to see things happening in that respect. And on top of all these five things, St. Clement's also offers an excellent Christian school. And if you can't afford it, we offer scholarships to members. We, have a, we offer a, a preschool, not just a daycare, a preschool. We provide an English-speaking program to those who want to learn to speak English. And they come not only from Mexico, and South America, but from countries around the world. Sometimes we've had 10 or 15 different nations represented in our English-speaking center. It's crazy. And so, we, you know, we not only offer our facilities for all these things, but for ministries that aren't, you know, directly under us. We've been asked to we're always being asked, would you provide, would you provide space? We've housed uh, different churches over in St. George's. We house a food bank. You want to know what we charge them? A dollar a year. And I say all this to make one point, and that is that I have never been in my entire life in a church that was as generous as this church, that gave as much not only to its own people, but to those outside. I've never seen a church or been a part of a church that gave as much as St. Clement's, as you do. And my point is this. I believe that as a body, we have been faithful to God. And I believe that if a person wants to give to the Lord through St. Clement's, that we're worthy of it, that we've proven ourselves worthy of it, that when we give to St. Clement's, we're giving to a place that is going to use what God has given us 
for the things that he cares about. I want that to sink into your consciousness. And this year, our vestry is asking the body to think about doing something very bold, to take God as his word and to consider tithing, giving 10% back to him. Because there's only one place in the entire Bible that God says, test me in this, and that's in Malachi 3.10. Now, we're not like some churches. We don't require a W-2 to be turned in, and I know churches like that. I have family members that used to be in churches like that. Send us your W-2. We'll bill you. Aren't you glad we don't do that? You know, you're supposed to take some personal responsibility in this. You're supposed to pray and ask the Lord. Now, don't pray and say, Lord, am I supposed to give anything? Because he's already said you are. You don't want to be that person who says, Lord, I'm just giving you back what you gave me. Thanks very much. Don't be that guy. Because all that last servant had to do was make an effort. Make an effort. He didn't have to necessarily double his money, but instead he just went and buried it. But what I'd like to suggest is you pray and you truly ask the Lord, Lord, what am I to give? And if it comes back more than you had in mind, then it's probably him saying it. So, I'm asking you to pray not only for yourselves, for guidance, but I'm asking you to pray for all of us that we all might be faithful to the Lord, that we all might be approved of the Lord, that we all might be found faithful stewards of what he's given us. Would you pray with me today? Father, when we take the time to reflect, we can't begin to thank you for all the things that you've done for us, and especially for the most precious gift of all, of knowing Jesus, of knowing you as our Heavenly Father, of knowing the Holy Spirit in our lives, and experiencing a taste of eternity. Lord, as we walk with you, as we worship you, as we read your word, as we as we seek to follow you daily. And Father, we ask that you'd help us to be faithful. Because Lord, St. Clements would like to do more. We'd like to give more to missions. We'd like to give, we'd like to do more mission work. We'd like to do more ministry. So Father, I pray that you help us to be faithful to you. And that you bless this congregation for its faithfulness, and each person for their faithfulness, as you promised to do. In Jesus' name, amen.